Hello and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. We're joined by Zachary Cummings, who currently is the Director of Sales Operations at Artemis Health Inc. Now, Zachary originated from a, a business that we have actually had another guest from, so Kelsey, who's currently head of Sales Ops at Workfront. Um, but what I think is going to be interesting about this conversation is that Zachary has well, kind of recently transitioned over from the account management and from the sales side. So we're going to see sales operations from the view of one of the reps that we often talk about on the show. So Zachary, welcome. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Would you agree with my intro there that you, you've recently shifted over from the dark side or the light side, whichever way you want to look at it? <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely. Um, I, I have always considered myself a salesperson and I think you know, taking the sales ops position with a sales mentality um, has been extremely helpful. Awesome. Um, so I'm actually interested to hear about that. Like, why did you decide? I think it was the, it was the Artemis Health, right? That you shifted from the field uh -huh. into the ops team. Yeah, well, I think uh, a lot of sales managers that are uh, helping individual contributors um, end up doing a lot of sales operations functions. Um, I think if they're good at uh, running their teams. So a lot of times, you know, you're gonna have um, a couple of really high performers, a couple of mid-range performers, and then a couple of performers that you're really trying to train up, right? Um, and what, what happens is you'll find, you know, somebody is doing something really innovative. And you'll think, oh my goodness, I have to, I have to roll this out to my entire team. Um, and then it, it, it just starts to um, cascade to even other teams and other organizations. Um, and, and I saw that happening on my teams and it's definitely a sales ops uh, type function. And, and it's exactly what we want sales ops um, to be doing, which is finding those innovative things that we can do and then having the entire um, organization uh, implement those things and, and hopefully increase efficiency or increase productivity across all the teams. So I really liked those sales operation that operations aspects of um, you know running the teams and uh, so you know my VP of sales was gracious enough to take a gamble on me and, and I, I switched over and it's been fantastic and we've been able to do some of those um, productivity gaining um, implementations and productivity gaining initiatives that have been really fun. Sure so are you saying that as a manager you were uh basically doing part of the sales ops role uh, and you really enjoyed seeing that the kind of greater impact of your work influencing both people within your team and other teams. Is, is that accurate? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I'd say even, even individual sales reps, you know, when they're innovating and testing out messaging or testing out things in the sales process, um, it, you know, one of the, one of the most important things is to hear from those reps. Um, because as a sales ops leader, you know, you're not always on demos. You're not always uh, listening to the to the customer. So you need that feedback a ton. And so, uh, you know, uh, individual contributors and managers can always, um, uh, you know, help sales ops to to uh, implement uh, those innovative things that they're testing out in the market. Got it. So zooming in now today to Artemis Health, what is the current sales tech stack? Yeah, so uh, ours I'd say is, is pretty standard. You know, we use salesforce.com as our CRM. Um, we're very, uh, you know, we, we have a mantra that says if, it, if, if it's not in Salesforce, it didn't happen. Um, so we, we focus really heavily on getting as much as possible into Salesforce. Uh, we use LinkedIn Sales Navigator. We use uh, actually a really interesting uh, piece of software that we implemented based off of one of the um, sales development representatives testing something out and then us pushing it out to the entire team. Uh, it's called Vidyard. It's a software that allows you to, um, you know, send videos via email and have, uh, you know, some, some uh, videos that are, that are queued up. Uh, very cool software, but again, it all came from 
from the rep's perspective that said, hey, I want to test this out. I want to make my emails much more personable. And then it, he had so much success. Um, he increased his conversion rate by 16% um, within like uh, just a couple of weeks of using the software. And so we immediately pushed that out to everybody. And it's been really successful. Um, we use Sales Loft um, for a lot of the prospecting activities and cadences. Um, and then marketing uses Marketo uh, as their marketing automation uh, tool. And we also use uh, Confluence to document, um, you know, all of our internal processes and, and things. Got it. Um, I actually want to talk about that a little bit more. So we could call this like bottom-up tech discovery. So many ops teams or managers okay. are like, this, this is the stack that we're going to use. But actually what I'm hearing here is that there is potential to, to pass that responsibility onto the reps and actually understand what they're using. So a question would be, how can you encourage that within an organization? Yeah, so we, we actually have a, a fun thing that we do with all of our reps. Um, and, and it's where every, every month or so we have what's called a testing meeting. Um, and we, we um, encourage every single rep to come up with some sort of uh, a test that they want to run in their territories. Um, that could be something about messaging, something about, you know, a tool, something about, um, you know, a type of cadence they want to run. And we take a very scientific approach and we say, okay, you can test anything that costs under $100, um, but you have to be able to track it with data. And then you have to be able to say at the end of the test, um, did it work? Did it not work? Are you going to try something different, right? Um, and and the, so the Vidyard uh, solution came out of exactly one of those meetings. Um, and and again, it was based on data, so it wasn't just a shot in the dark. It was it was a free trial that he had used, um, and you know there was there was a lot of success. So we we see a lot of different things coming out of those testing meetings. Um, but yeah, you you've you've got to really empower your reps to think strategically. Um, as a sales ops professional, as I mentioned, I'm not going to be on calls all day long. I'm not going to be on demos all day long. I don't, I don't always know the specific needs as well as, as an individual rep on the front lines is going to, is going to, you know, know and understand their buyers and what they need. So, um, yeah, we, we, we encourage that a lot here. I bet the impact that has on like the engagement of the reps must be really good. Like they're no longer like the pawns oh, yeah. that are just running the process that you have to find. <laughs> That's that, that we've never heard yep. of that before. I think it's really interesting. Um, just quickly before we continue the ratio of like sales reps versus people in the ops team. Uh, we have three people in ops, including myself, um, and about 15, uh, SDRs and closers. So kind of a smaller org. Awesome. Um, and you mentioned just now about, increasing productivity. Can you name something that you, that you've tested that either did work or didn't work to drive productivity with those 15 reps? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, you know, one of, one of the things that, uh, has been really, really helpful is, um, the way we do our daily metrics. This is more on the sales development side. Um, I'd say and not, not as much on the, um, on the closer side. But uh, we do daily metrics based on results and then efforts. So, for example, you always want to have results. Um, you always want to have things enter into pipeline, right? You always want to have, um, uh, like, like, really good demos, uh, qualified sales opportunities. Sometimes you're not going to be able to have one of those every day, right? So we, we take an approach where it's, okay, you have to have at least, you know, pipeline generated in the day. If you can't have that, then we need some sort of effort um, equivalent, okay? So it might be a number of conversations that you have or number of voicemails you leave or number of cadences that you follow in a day. Now, let's say somebody is continually hitting their, um, their effort metric and not hitting the result metric. Well, that's a great time for a manager to always know, hey, I'm, I'm not training this person, right? They're, they're obviously not saying the right things or they're not sending out the right messages. So um, it's increased our productivity because uh, it's pushing everybody towards the right things. And it's not just like, I need 120 dials today. 
um, there's also like, you know, this, this human element, like, Hey, we want you to have success. That's really what we're driving towards. We're not driving to 120 dials. We're driving to, towards success. So um, that's been something that's been really productive. Um, the other thing on the closer side that we've just implemented that's been really helpful is uh, what I call our discounting matrix. Um, you know, we're in the enterprise space and so deals can get very complex and um, giving closers the autonomy to be flexible with their contract at the same time, making sure that we're closing responsible deals has been very, very difficult. So what I did is I created a big scoring card with uh, several different variables that could happen on a contract, you know, like uh, contract length, um, overall discount, um, the uh, the number of like um, I guess uh, abstract clauses that get into the contract, um, different things that you know aren't just discounts, and it allows this, the sales reps to have flexibility. But each of those variables changes where they're able to be flexible on. So, for example, if, if they have a ton of discounting, they probably can't get approved a um, a smaller contract length. If they have a price that's really high and, you know, maybe they're even pricing above our list price, then that gives them more flexibility in these other aspects. What's great about that is you don't have the CFO, um, you know, uh, worried about deals not like being responsibly closed. You don't have sales managers like trying to figure out how to communicate this to all of the decision makers. It's giving flexibility at the same time, uh, responsible deals. That's been really impactful, and it's, it's helped our reps, you know, get through contracting a lot quicker. Got it. So this is another example of you kind of pushing more responsibility onto the rep, but still within a framework that is going to allow the business to survive. Um, awesome. And then yeah. one more question. Um, your point about the, the daily kind of results and efforts, really like that. You, you said that if they're hitting effort and not results, then they need training. But what about if they're hitting results and not effort? Do, is that just okay? Or do you do anything with those reps as well? You know, um, it, that's, that's a really great question. And I think uh, conceptually, it, I think it depends on the rep. Um, sometimes, sometimes you want a rep to continue uh, driving. And other times it's like, hey, if, if you've put in, you know, if you've put in 90 hours this week and, and you're hitting your metrics, like I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you take off uh, on a Friday. Um, but, but it really depends. If, if somebody's really bought in, and, and I think you can give them a little bit of leeway. Um, if, if they're not helping their fellow reps, if they're not, um, you know, being a leader, mentoring, showing people, um, like, what's going on, you know, like, for example, in those testing meetings, if they're not really engaged, then, yeah, I want to see, see results and effort. But uh, if they are really engaged and, and um, you know, you – they, they're hitting their numbers and they're working more efficiently versus um, hard. Uh, I, I'm okay with giving them a little leeway. And I think some sales leaders will probably disagree with me on that. But uh, um, I, in the past, you know, we're dealing with humans and we're dealing with people that, you know, get the, get the phones hung up on them all day long. Uh, I think it's okay to give them a little bit of leeway here and there. And I think it's going to, it's going to add to some longevity within the role um, and, uh, you know, it'll, 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 uh, it'll make them feel like they're not micromanaged. Um, we try to do that, you know, probably as you've heard a lot here, um, we deal with really big deals. Uh, we, we can't just have dial monkeys. We need people that are really smart, um, and, uh, can, can really think outside the box. So we, we give them a little bit of leeway. Got it. Have you, um, cause I'm assuming based on, talking with you that but your churn of reps is probably lower than the average. Have you done any like benchmarked the churn of your reps against other people in your industry or is that not something that you look at? No, we definitely look at it. Um, <clears throat> I think it goes back to our hiring process. Um, we, we take a very data driven approach and we're very transparent. Um, you know, some, some places will say, Hey, if you're a sales development rep, you know, we'll be able to promote you in 12 months. Uh, we would never say anything like that, whether we think it's true or not. Um, we always say, look, um, come in here. If you, uh, you know, if you do well and there's not a spot here, 
uh, we will absolutely help you find a spot somewhere else if you've outgrown the role, but we're not going to promise a, a promotion in 12 months or 24 months or even 36 months. So, um, yeah, our, our average, um, like, uh, sales development um, longevity is, is pretty high. Um, we've had some turnover. Usually it's because we've got really smart people that have trained themselves up and, and done so fantastically that they have gotten promotions at other, other places. So I wouldn't say our churn is lower than most places, but uh, the churn is, um, it's almost a testament to, I think, some of the sales leadership here that have done such a great job training the reps up um, and getting them promoted, whether, whether it's here or somewhere else. All right, and of course, your operations team, Zach. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We might have contributed here or there. <laughs> um, okay, cool. Let's look at the uh, sales forecasting process. How involved are you with that? Uh, pretty involved. Um, we, we take a traditional approach. Uh, we, we forecast based on commit levels. Um, so it's uh, commit, gut, or target. Commit meaning it's going to close. Uh, gut meaning uh, we, we can probably pull this in. Um, there's a 50-50 chance. And then target is like, hey, if all the stars align, like this is coming in. So uh, we, we have a, a biweekly um, forecasting call with um, a lot of the executives here um, and the sales managers. <clears throat> where we go through pipeline. And that's really a, a meeting for us to look at where we're at, look at where we think we're going to be, um, and then rally around certain initiatives. You know, marketing gets very involved and says, okay, what can we do to, um, you know, get a couple of these deals over the finish line? You know, we take a very tailored approach. Um, it's, it's the opposite of transactional sell. And so we'll have uh, marketing sometimes even create custom videos with the CEO talking about how, how we want to partner with a certain prospect that's in the pipeline. Um, and so it, it's fun to see some very tailored initiatives come out of our, our forecasting meeting. Got it. And because these deals are of such value, marketing are involved in a specific account, a specific deal capacity. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yep. Correct. Um, okay, cool. And then from your experience as a, as a salesperson manager and in operations, which is the one sales metric that if you could only measure one for the rest of your life, you would choose? Oh, can I cheat and tell you if it wouldn't be win rate, it would probably be like closed one reasons. So why are we winning? Probably, probably between those two. Um, I think they're, they're probably the most important. Got it. And why, why specifically the closed one reasons? I guess you can see how you're building capacitors and you can feed that back into the process. Yeah, I, I think it, uh, I, that's not just a sales metric. Um, you know, one of the things we noticed is we were winning because of our product, but then we, 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 you know, got some other feedback from our clients and realized that they were renewing because of our services. And so it was like a really good indicator. Okay, sales was doing really good at um, selling the product. And then services was doing a fantastic job of helping us um, get clients that are champions and get clients that love us. So like, it's not just a sales metric. And that's why I really like that one because it can totally dictate, you know, what product fo focuses on, what marketing focuses on, what services focus on. Um, so, so for me, that's like a huge, huge one. And then obviously on the flip side, why we lose, um, which again, does the exact same thing. It, it helps product figure out, okay, like we're having an issue with this area or we're having an issue with that area, or they'll tell sales, Hey guys, like you didn't, uh, you know, you, you didn't follow the sales process. You, you, you know, they didn't respond to our demo. We didn't do enough discovery, all those types of things. Got it. And then final question about the person who has inspired you the most in sales operations. Oh, I got to give a shout out to uh, Cade Kruger. He's our VP of sales here. He, uh, you know, he took a gamble on me and, and uh, he, he's been in sales ops as, as well and um, has really mentored me through a lot. Um, yeah. 
just just a fantastic stand-up guy that has helped me over the past you know four-ish years um, figure out this thing called sell tops, and we've had a lot of fun doing it. So that was Kay Kruger. Correct. Awesome. Shout out to Kay. Um, okay, so I wrote. So I think this first time I've actually written. You can see here in the camera two pages of notes um but the thing the, the one thing that i uh, maybe i'll just say one part normally i say two or three things that i like but i think the one thing that i think is so interesting is how you have been relinquish, willing, relinquishing some of the control from management and operations onto the individual reps um like especially your monthly hundred dollar test thing and also the discount metric uh, matrix so what why I think this is so powerful if you're like empowering and engaging the reps to help f feed and change the process as opposed to them just being the, 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 the pawns that go through the process that you define. And so I think that's really, really a really powerful idea that I think could help a lot of, a lot of people in the audience and a lot of people that have come on the show. So Zach, I think we'll, we'll close with that. Thank you so much for all your insights. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.